Hello, I'm David Kerr, Director of Communications with the Diocese of Lansing here in uh, Michigan. And today is Wednesday, the 9th of December. And in a few hours' time, there will be a, a Holy Mass offered in St. Mary Cathedral next door upon the anniversary of the dedication of the cathedral in 1937. But as a diocese, we're also marking two other special occasions today, the 25th anniversary of the ordination to the Episcopate of the Emeritus Bishop of this diocese, uh, the Most Reverend Carl Mengling, and also to mark, to celebrate, to give thanks for the 90th birthday of Bishop Mengling too. And I'm delighted to say that Bishop Mengling joins us now. Bishop Mengling, how are you doing? I'm peaceful. That's good. I'm glad to hear it. Healthy. <laughs> That's good. Tick, tick. <laughs> Tell us, 90 uh, years old, born in 1930, yeah. in the city of Hammond in Indiana. That's right. Uh, tell us about your upbringing. Well, it would have been there mm -hmm. in uh, Lake County. And it's called Lake because it's right on Lake Michigan. It's not in the water, but, you know, borders it. And it's right next to Chicago. So we... Uh, we were just part of the whole big Chicago thing, even though we were in Indiana right on the line. Um, we, were, we were called Chicago Hoosiers. Hoosiers are what Indiana people are called. So uh, we never knew Indianapolis existed. It was everything Chicago. That was the center of our life. We got the Chicago Tribune every day all my life as I grew up. And, and uh, my dad worked uh, in those big um, steel mills right on the Lake Michigan there. There's, there were seven of them at that time, and it was the biggest industry. They said during World War II that if, uh, if the Nazis or the, or the Japanese were going to bomb, that's a place they would really bomb first to get rid of all that industry. And there were seven big oil refineries there. It was a, nothing but an but a, um, industrial area. That's where I grew up. And uh, uh, tell us about your mother and father. They were they were German immigrants. Is that correct? Yes, um, they did not come from Germany together. They didn't know each other over there. After World War One, there were millions of immigrants that came from there and from all of Europe, just like after World War Two. But after that time, because that whole area where I grew up, the whole Chicago area or Detroit or. Cleveland or Philadelphia in the 30s. Uh, it was all immigrants. and You heard every language you could possibly learn. And uh, we grew up with kids of every nationality you could think of. And we learned all kinds of words. Of course, the, the words we learned most were all the dirty ones. <laughs> you know, kids. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it was a, it was a very a different world from today. And it was the time of the Depression, too. So when I think of the Depression in the 30s, and I was born in 30, and it went on until, and then World War uh, II, uh, that whole period uh, was, was, was uh, heavy for everybody, especially there, and uh, because of the industry and the importance of all of that and so on. I went to... Uh, uh, I was baptized a Lutheran, so my dad's family were all Lutheran in Germany. Although when I did go there to um, meet them for the first time in, that would have been 1962, his brother Wilhelm and his sister, he had three sisters, and their, and their kids were big already too. Um, they, were, they were all Lutheran, but nobody went to church. Nobody went to church at all. Uh, but they were nice people. I got along well with them. But uh, so uh, I went to public school for a number of years. And then uh, the wonderful thing that happened around that whole area around Chicago, and it was a Catholic world at that time. It really was. So was Detroit. Most of the people were Catholic. And uh, there weren't all these big crises that we've got today. And, uh, but we had the Depression and the war and all that. Uh, and so... Uh, what, what, what happened in, in all of the, these situations. There were around the whole south of Chicago in, Chico in Illinois and Indiana, and they were all the same thing, really. There were a lot of small towns, which are now big, huge, big, mm -hmm. ugly suburbs, mm -hmm. but, uh, but in the, my time. And uh, the Catholic parishes and the Lutheran parishes, uh, 
they provided probably the only entertainment. There were no movies. There was that was just starting. There was no television. There was nothing, and um, so they would have a uh, church picnics uh, every um, every summer. Every parish, whether it's Lutheran or Catholic, had church picnics, and uh, the the priests from the parishes that were Catholic, and I knew all of them, uh, and I knew all of those priests eventually too. Uh, they went to these picnics, and it was just a one-day affair. Maybe may the uh, drinks and games for the kids and bingo and the simplicity that you can think of. And at at that one big picnic, and it was in a parish in Illinois, right across from uh, Indiana. There, uh, that old church is still standing there. Now, after the war, when all the soldiers came back and they had the money to build houses, the big suburb, suburbs went up in south, that part of South Chicago. Uh, Park Forest is one mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. huge place. And, um, and then that old church closed and they built a new one, St. Irenaeus, there. But that old church and uh, all of my family, were, we went to these picnics. There was nothing else. And uh, we were all there. And I was, uh, oh, somewhere in the 30, maybe 30, six, seven years old or something like that. And, um, and my mother was raised a Catholic. Her whole family from Eastern Germany were all Catholics. But like many immigrants that came over um, after the wars, um, they, they didn't have German faith, German parishes. There were big ones downtown Chicago. There still are. but, but uh, so, so she drifted away from the church like all of them did. Now, there, I had a, an uncle, two uncles that came with her, the brothers, and one sister came with her too. And so they were all there, and they had kids then. And there was my sister, Alfreda, was already there, and then I was too. And then the picnic went on. But the fascinating thing and, uh, was that one of the priests from a parish in Indiana, um, and it's, that's still around there, where Crown Point is and all those mm -hmm. places. Those are all big places now, but anyway. Uh, his name was uh, Father Hildebrandt. He spoke German. And uh, he, he met our entire clan there and uh, got to know them all and found out that these were all lapsed Catholics, but they wished that they were not. They, weren't, they didn't quit the church or nothing. Mm -hmm. They were just caught in it, caught in nothing. So. Um, so that's where he met them. And uh, later on, he's, <laughs> my dad, once he became a Catholic, he told me this. He said, um, this is much later, in the 50s. He said, that began his drifting toward the church uh, because Father Hildebrandt had a beer with me. <laughs> <laughs> that would do it for most of us. He had a beer with him. So what, yeah. what age were you when you became a Catholic? You were received into the church? Uh, nine. Nine. So that came after that. And that's where then, since we lived in Indiana then, right near there, and then they got connected with this priest, and uh, they, they all got back into the church. Wow. And it was ironic, um, in, in the town of Highland where we, where we lived, one of those small towns, but not anymore. And at Highland, there was no Catholic parish. It was one of the few. But it was uh, not far from Lake Michigan and all the big industry and all that junk. And there, um, I was in public school. I think I was in second grade. And my sister was in, she's four years older. She would have been in sixth grade, my sister. And one day, uh, we were, uh, removed from the school, taken out of the school, and we were put in St. Mary's School in a nearby other town where there was a parish where this Hildebrandt was the pastor. Mm -hmm. So that's my conversion. It's no big story. But anyway, so I got into this Catholic school, and it was uh, the sisters that taught there were the Franciscans, and I remember every one of them. Uh, and they were from uh, near South Bend. You know where that is? Mm -hmm. The city of Mishawaka, and the wonderful community. And they were our teachers, and nothing but sisters. That's the way it was in every Catholic school. There were no lay teachers and nothing like that. And um, that, that's where my, my coming into the church came. 
And of course, the first thing, and there were all kinds of other immigrants. There were Slovak kids there, there were Lithuanian kids there, and it's all the same story for all of them with language and problems and fallen away. But they're all Catholics. But he got a lot of them back, so did others. So what happened was, uh, we were then to be, pre be prepared for, we had to be baptized. See, in those days, uh, see, we recognize Lutheran baptisms now and certain other ones, but there's a lot of these sects we don't recognize at all because they're nutty. Uh, not the sects, but the way they do baptisms. Uh, so um, we were prepared for baptism, and, um, and this came to a point. Uh, Hildebrand didn't know a lot of this that we're going to get into, uh, but the sister who was preparing us for baptism, now, the baptism, the kids being baptized, they were a little bit, that did, they had that too going on, but these were all, every age is in all sizes. It's just a big, big mixed up group. We have photographs, you know, and you look at it, and, and here's a little first communion, cute little children, and then you got this yucky looking one and this older one, and there's my older sister there. <laughs> it's, all, it's really corny, but anyhow, but it was true. And um, so the sister then went to, Father Hildebrand to say, um, uh, I don't have any baptisms for these two. So you have to, when you do a, 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 for a convert and a, a, a baptism that's going to be conditional, you have to have that first baptism. And then he, and then, uh, he said, well, we'll have to find out where we can get that record. And he found it out pretty fast. And it was at the, uh, uh, Emmanuel Lutheran Church on um, the big boulevard in Hammond was a city of about 100,000 at that time, big big stores and all that junk. And um, it was on Sibley Boulevard, and it still is today. In fact, uh, when I got my first parish as a priest, it was at All Saints on Sibley Boulevard, and right down the street from me was Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Where it all began? Yeah, where I was baptized as Lutheran. And uh, just out of curiosity, I, I walked down to that, and that pastor that baptized me was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, God bless him and God bless Father yeah. Elderbrand. And as you yeah. allude to, uh, you, you know, a German uh, immigrant family, and you alluded to the fact you, you spoke German uh, we all as did. a family. Well, we had to. Do you still speak German? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, would, I, I had a lot of opportunities to do that. You know, I'd, I'd be a lot of the number well, give of... Us, give us some German. Can you speak some German yeah, for us? Yeah, it's Deutsch. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, people say, Sprechen uh, Sie Deutsch, do you speak German? The Germans don't talk like that. They say, Kannst du Deutsch? Can you Deutsch? Yeah. Yeah. Ja, ich, wir haben zu Hause Deutsch gesprochen und äh, die Eltern und äh, äh, alle, alle die äh, Menschen, die, die sind immer zu unser Haus gekommen für, für, für Festtage und, und so weiter. Äh, wir haben alle Deutsch gesprochen, ja. Yeah. I know, Phil, I'm doing an interview with Cardinal Ratzinger. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. I know um, him. We is that were, right? Oh, we were good friends and we spoke Tell German us. together. Tell us. Oh, I will d later. Right, okay. But th that's the, la the last time I saw him. He wasn't the Pope yet. He was the head of the Congregation of the Faith, mm -hmm. which is one of the most important in Rome. And it was when the, uh, 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 the, uh, the bishops of Ohio and Michigan were there for the ad limina mm -hmm. visit. You know mm -hmm. what that mm -hmm. is? And that's every five years, and it's a week of nothing but review, and a meeting with all of the heads of the various congregations, and so on and so on. The last time for that, and that was in 2000, I think it was four. He was, he, no, he was, no, he became pope in 2005, yeah. But this was 2004, and it was the last day, and it was Saturday. And the last day, you spend a whole day let's say with the Congregation for the Liturgy or the Congregation of Education, and they had all their reports ahead of time, and the whole day was that. It was great stuff, I liked it. So anyway, so this was uh, with uh, Ratzinger and all about the issues about the faith, and that was a whole day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was to end at 12, 
because a number of the bishops had airline tickets to go back and all this kind of junk. And so then uh, there were about, I'd say, 25 of us there. And that would be the bishops of Ohio and uh, Michigan, plus their auxiliaries and you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, the meeting ended, and then he stood like if you would, is that an exit that wherever? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, uh, these the rooms are big like this, and um, he went and stood by the door, and they all lined up and said goodbye and left through the door, and there was another bishop and myself, and he was a very young one, just made bishop of Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. Kevin Britt. He died suddenly, but anyway, Kevin and I had some questions that we wanted to ask uh, the cardinal privately. So uh, we just waited, and then he comes, he comes back, and we began to blab with him. But then, uh, and, but Kevin had, didn't have much time because he had, a, he had to get to the airport to get a flight back to, uh, it didn't go to Grand Rapids, of course, it would go to Chicago or someplace like that. So anyway, so there we were, and then I'm, I'm them, there sitting there with the Ratzinger, and wir sprechen Deutsch, yeah. So anyway, so it got to be about, oh, 10 to, 10 to 12 or 5 to 12, and then he looked at his watch, and, he, and then he had, there is a, a, an old German cemetery built by one of the Kaisers in the year about 1000, behind St. Peter's with all kinds of old graves and an ancient old um, church right next to that. And uh, he had the noon mass there every day. And so he said, he said, well, we, we must not etwas waschen. And, uh, and then we have to Fuß gegangen and erzählen am Weg nach uh, die Kirche. Well, I'm like, you want me to speak German, you know, but I, anyway, you don't know what I'm saying anyway, do you? I'm presuming he's asking you, would you care to concelebrate? No, no. No, right, okay, you tell me. That didn't exist then. That's oh. what's, no. And so, so he, um, so we walked from, from that big business, that place where the Congregation of the Faith met, which was a very gigantic old place, about 600 years old, still there too. And then we had to go across the whole piazza and everything, and then around the back of St. Peter's. So we did that whole big walk together. And, uh, and then we finally got to the church about the last minute. And there's a few steps up, and the church was full of people. It's a beautiful old church. It's about 1,000 years old. And, um, and he stood at the door, and I held it open for him. And I said, I said, uh, Your Eminence, have you any final advice for me? You don't believe, you'll never, you're not going to believe what he said to me. What? He said, teach, teach, teach. And I've been doing it ever since. And I'm still doing it with the sisters at DeWitt. That's yeah. a great story. That's a that's great a, story. That's the last time uh, that I, I had ever met with him but I knew him before. And then he became Pope, of course, and I, I never got over it. Or did I? No. I never got over when he was Pope, but I did get over there a number of times and was with uh, John Paul II like this, and most bishops were. But see, he was Pope 27 years, and now this is uh, much too late already. So uh, how did we get into this conversation? Um, I'm not too sure, but I'm glad that we did. But I'm going to take you from Rome in 2004 back to uh, Indiana uh, yeah. in uh, 1948. That's right. Because that's, you graduated high school in that year. You then enter seminary. That's right. Uh, and, and when did you first, as a young man, start to think that God was calling you to the sacred priesthood? I did, I did when I was in the seventh and eighth grade. And it was especially due to two people. She there was a young priest that was just assigned to the parish. He was ordained 1945. And uh, he was very young. And he was very much involved with all the young people. High school, I mean, the grade school and the high school and all that kind of thing. It was a large parish. And what was his name? Charles Bisher. B-U-E-S-C-H-E-R. He was from Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. That was all the diocese of Fort Wayne at that time. Fort Wayne went from Illinois to Ohio. There was no Gary Diocese yet. That'll come much later. Mm -hmm. And Lafayette didn't exist either. 
but it was that third of Indiana north was Fort Wayne. And so, so um, uh, it was him, and he, uh, he, he, was, uh, he, was, uh, he was on fire. And at the same time, he, he was um, very friendly with everybody. Including my dad, who was who was their son. My dad never went to church, like to go uh, to the midnight mass and all, like most people do. He never would go. He never went to anything. See, he couldn't do anything. He he was convinced that he could never become a Catholic until his mother in Germany died, because it would hurt her so badly. And is that is that what happened? He was received into the church it, after his mother died. After 1953, Gosh. she died, and then he that? came to the church. But there's another factor involved in that mm. too. But the th the thing about uh, his mother, whom I never met, of course, uh, she was a devout Lutheran, and that's what he remembered. And he didn't want to hurt her feelings. Now his brothers and sisters still were over there with her, but they didn't go to church. But evidently, that didn't bother her at all. Yeah. So the, the, the priesthood, your, your, your first inklings of being drawn to the sacred priesthood, um, you were explaining that, that uh, this young priest, this dynamic young priest yeah, was... Yeah, he did. He did. He, um, not directly, you know, said, you ought to go to the seminary, you kid. <laughs> Nothing like that. But, but no, it's just, it was just uh, his, his um, um, modality and the way he operated and everything else. And then there was one of the sisters, the one that taught me, and the others in the seventh and eighth grade. She was our teacher in seventh and eighth grade, and then she, then she moved on, and we had her again in eighth what, grade. What was her name? Sister Fridian, and she was from Germany. She spoke German. Not that that made any difference, because most of the kids mm -hmm. didn't speak German anyway. But, but, she, uh, but she was a powerhouse. That, that, I look back, that was probably the most educated sister, intelligent, and God knows what all I could imagine. She should have been a university president. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was another one. And she was a good friend, and he and I, uh, all, all these years after that. So... Um, well, God bless them and God rest them. Well, then I had to go with my dad. I wanted to go to the Catholic high school, and that was in Hammond. It was a big high, it was a big school. In fact, I had ended up teaching there for five years. And at that time, we had over 3,000 students, all those big high schools around German, and we, in, in Chicago and public, and they were, well, they were just huge schools. Uh, but that's much later. Bishop Knoll High School. And Bishop Knoll was the Bishop of Fort Wayne, who helped to build the National Shrine in Washington. He was the, one of the key people promoting that. And so, um, I wanted to go to the Catholic high school, but my dad would not allow us to go to the Catholic high school because uh, he wasn't a Catholic mm -hmm. yet and he's not going to pay for it and you know all the rest of the junk. So I didn't. And I had to go to this public school, which uh, was all second rate. I found out when I f <laughs> got to the seminary, and I was 17 when I graduated because I turned 18 in October, you know how that works. And uh, I went to, to seminary, St. Minor. That's about 300 miles south of there on the Ohio River. Mm -hmm. It's a big monastery, Benedictine Abbey. There were over 800 students in that place. And they had the three levels. They had a high school there for seminarians. They had a college for seminarians. And then four years of theology for seminarians to become priests. 12-year program. Now, I missed the first four, of course. I went to public high school. But I found out very quickly when I got into class with these others in college and all that, that I was two years behind them from that lousy public school I was in. Mm -hmm. and, found, and it dawned on me what a puke that was for four years. I'm sorry to say that. But That's allowed. I, can, I, I do not have any good memory of one teacher in that four years in public high school. Not one. So how many years in seminary were you in total? Nine. Nine? Yeah. Should have been eight. See, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, uh, when I got there in uh, 48, and there was always new guys coming in. Well, in fact, the freshmen for high school, you'd have, uh, there were 450 in that high school. You'd have 100 new ones every year, but I'm not talking about that. These are people who've been to high school already and screwed it all up. And in that group, there were 22 of us. They didn't know what to do with us. <laughs> and of the 22, there were about five that were still foxhole conversions from World War II, 
who, you know, in the foxholes, mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. was, there were thousands of those that they're going to, God, if you let me live, I'll become a priest, I swear it, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So we had five of those plus the rest of us. So what they did, they said, we're going to give you an extra year. That's why it's nine. And, be, and I'll tell you why, and I'm glad they did, because the number one thing we had to do in that extra year, the 22 of us, uh, which we didn't get, and, and those four, those guys that went to the seminary high school, they got it. We didn't know only Latin. We had to learn four years of Latin in one year. But you did it. We sure did. There was a great Benedictine priest who was good at that. Which then means that nine years you're ordained uh, in 1957. Should uh, have been 56. Okay. Yeah. Um, for the newly created Diocese of Gary, what do you remember of your day? Of ordination well it was a uh, it should have never happened because we were there were ten of us at st. Mindred who was seminary who were seminarians for the Fort Wayne diocese and in 56 we were already in the holy orders of deacons which meant we were completely part of the Fort Wayne diocese and then right at Christmas time that year we already knew that in 57 in May we would be ordained priests in Fort Wayne, the 10 of us. Now the whole class was about 57 of us deacons, they were from about 20 different dioceses. But anyway, so we were, nobody had the slightest idea of this Gary thing. We didn't. We were all incarnated already in Fort Wayne and what happened and then they announced this new diocese right right around Christmas time and that was a shock to everybody well they needed it because there's about a million people in that corner of Indiana suburbs of Chicago there yeah so they needed that diocese it's a small one there's three counties I think or something like that so anyway so what happened was what would happen to us there were four of us from Lake County and uh, we were blessed because there was a new bishop in Fort Wayne. Bishop Noel died in 56, and as his seminarians, we were all there for that. And then, uh, after that, uh, there was a new bishop appointed, and that was Bishop Leo Persley. Persley, just brand new baby bishop. And he was nice enough. He, 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 He didn't have to do this, because he could say, you belong here, and that's it which was true, but he gave the 10 of us a choice to stay in Fort Wayne, South Bend, or uh, go to the new Diocese of Gary. So of course the four of us from Lake County, we are the first, we were called the first fruits, you know, of of the uh, the diocese, the new Diocese of Gary. That's how that worked. That was a miracle, miracle. So ordained in 57, uh, and the record shows that you, you're an, an associate uh, in parishes through till 1961. You're then sent to Rome by your diocese, by your bishop, in order to do further studies. You arrive in Rome in 61, and uh, lo and behold, in 1962, the Second Vatican Council opens in Rome. And uh, you are, uh, now I know you're going to dispute this title, but your official biography says you were a page at the Second Vatican Council. For those who don't know, and that includes myself, what, 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 is, a, what is a page? And what are your memories of, a, of the Second Vatican Council actually being there in person? Do you have two hours? Uh, well, we've got a live stream, your mass at two o'clock, so uh, the, let, the, let, let's go for three, the, four, four minutes. The, the uh, what you call <laughs> it, the, the council lasted until 65. Mm-hmm. I left Rome in 64. Okay, now uh, the, the important thing was that there were they, they they asked priests from different countries, different languages, if they would come to uh, serve in the council. Uh, in in uh, how would you say uh, providing? We were providers in a sense. If you remember, the council was a big long thing that went up like this in St. Peter's Basilica yeah and, yeah and you had this, this big section here and the stairs going up and chairs all the way down like this yep. yeah we each of us had a section like that in mine there were 68 seats and they had a little table in front of them 
and they were in different levels going up. Okay? And that was all on both sides. And did bishops have the same, just out of curiosity, did bishops have a designated seat? That's right. Within, okay. That's right. So where were your bishops from that you were, you were looking after? Most of them were from uh, uh, Hispanic places. Right, okay. There were 68 bishops in my section, and I had to be there, and I had to provide everything for each one of their stations, whatever documentations they need or equipment, and then you're there through the whole thing because if they have a written message that they want sent to somebody way down over there, I had to deliver it or back and forth and, and, make, and provide the microphone if they were gonna be on the mic at this point down below where they were. You know, that was huge. There were 4,000 bishops there. And uh, now how they organized these bishops, um, it was by, by, by their age. Um, the youngest ones were at the doors furthest from the Baldacchino and, and, and where the cardinals were. And so the old, I was about the, the third group up going forward, that was mine, and there were two before me. Like, like uh, Karol Wojtyła, who was bishop of Krakow in Poland, was one of the youngest bishops, and he was right at the door, practically, in that first <laughs> one. See, in, in other words, they were, it was, uh, and that, that kept going on in seniority on both sides. The aisle is between them, so you got this bunch here, and you got these bunch here. You've seen pictures of that, haven't you? How, how did you feel being there and essentially not, not that the church is solely the episcopate, of course, but to see the, 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 the global church gathered in yeah. one place in St. Peter's Basilica. What were your feelings being involved in that and seeing that firsthand? Mine? Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was liberating. But the main thing, and then they in had... In what way? Well, the, 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 fa the fact that everyone there was able to hear and listen and then participate in all of this whatever was on the agenda for that day. But over on, way up toward the altar is, you had the long, it's a big table, mm -hmm. oh, like that over there, which was the, uh, where the presidents of the Vatican Council s sat. And that was right below the big Baltacino of St. Peter's, right way up, up the head of it all. And that's where they were. And then over on, and if you're facing this way, now my bishop's group was right over here, way back there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and, and then the rest of it just kept going. The cardinals were all in that last segment right over there. And then over there was a raised elevated section. Uh, and and uh, from there, those people could observe the whole thing, and those were the the uh, the members of the other Christian denominations. They were all in there. That was never done before, ever, ever. So, as, as as somebody who was there firsthand, uh, and we're now more than half a, a century on, uh, how would you describe the vision? If you were to crystallise the vision of the Second Vatican Council, how would you describe it? And as a, a scorecard, how have we got on in the intervening decades? in making that vision a reality? You've got two very important uh, observations or questions there. But from, from the start, the whole point of it was to reactivate our understanding and our appreciation and the mission of the church in terms of the whole content of the faith. And that was what they did for, uh, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, from 62 to 65, that's what they did. They went through everything. Liturgy was one thing, Catholic education was another, and that was in tremendous detail to, to freshen up our understanding of these things and the, the practicality of what are you going to do with it now, and so forth. And that was like there was, there was a whole thing about priesthood, for example, and uh, or religious life, and well, you name it. But it was everything. It was a kind of a, uh, not just a, a review, uh, as if we were outsiders examining some building somewhere. No, it was, it was a, a deeply seated, uh, personal, sacramental, 
grasp again of who Christ is, what Christ taught, and what the church teaches, and what the whole life of the church is, and, and what, what is the centrality, let's say, of the Eucharist, for example, and, and, and then right down the line, everything. And they did it, they did it beautifully. Now, the tra if you look at the bad, beautiful documents, and I listened to much of the. Now, I wasn't there for the last two sessions at all, I had to leave. Uh, but, uh, um, but if you read the documents, uh, they're magnificent, they're powerful. But see what happened, as soon as the council is done, then the maniacs got a hold of it all. Yeah. In what way? In changing things and misinterpreting things and deciding we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we had about, um, oh, oh no, thousands of men left the priesthood and thousands of religious that no longer taught in the schools. And so they had a whole new idea of what their vocations were, totally contrary to what the documents, let's say on religious life or on the priesthood or on Catholic education, the hell with that, you know. So which documents or which areas of the Second Vatican Council do you feel were most misinterpreted uh, and misapplied by as you? Those were, those were. Okay. Plus I think the other one was on the liturgy, what they did with the mass. And, and that's still going on. And you still have nutty ones that are doing all kinds of nutty stuff. But it, but it, was, it, was, it was like a plague back in the 60s and especially to 1968. Uh, when the whole world was in revolution, and when, when the Pope came out with uh, Humane Vitae, Paul VI, and, and all that sort of thing. And then it just, a lot of people just went crazy. Yeah. Uh, but that happens after every council, though. No. And uh, it's not a bad thing. So do you think we're getting there? Yeah. All, well, all sure. these decades down the We've been getting there all, all the time. What do you think I've been doing for, for 63 years as a priest? Did I crawl in the hole somewhere and do nothing? Well, let's, let, let's take it back to you returning from Rome. You return in 64, and then for three decades in the Diocese of Gary, you're in schools, you're in parishes, you're undertaking diocesan tasks. I did. How, how was life, to come back to planet Earth or planet Gary, how was that to be back in parish life and in schools? And well, that's what I wanted. I wanted... A I could have stayed in Rome and, and got a job there. There were, there were guys that did, and they were highly qualified. And I, a very close friend of mine, he was in Rome for 30 years and uh, became a cardinal eventually. But I, I, I could never think of that at all. I wanted to be a parish priest, and I wanted to teach in schools, That's, and I did that. What did you teach? Oh, I taught. You have no idea. My first, my first assignment was, uh, you know where Whiting is? Well, let's, if you leave Whiting, you're in Chicago. Okay. It's right on the corner of the lake there. And there are five parishes there. And I was assigned to uh, be a resident at um, Sacred Heart Parish for five years. And from there, I commuted to four different universities and colleges and seminaries to teach in the whole Chicago area. That's what I did for my first five years. Yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah. So you talked. And I helped out in the parish too. Now the parish, the priest that was there, it was a great guy named Father Miller. He was born deaf and dumb, but later on he uh, he got out of it somewhat. But his uh, his 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 speech was always sort of odd and so forth. Good good priest. Uh, the people revered him very much. But uh, I had to do a lot of work at that parish at the same time. The funny thing about Father Miller. There's a nice downtown area. It's on 117th Street. Now the streets from Chicago and into Indiana, they're, they're the same numbers, 117th, 117th Street. It's, well, that's very close to downtown Chicago. Now the streets go all down to 175th Street, wait, and they cross back and forth all the way, except once you're in Indiana, the next year in Illinois or Chicago or whatever. But he, the downtown in Whiting, it was, wasn't a large, but it was a very good, beautiful old stores, a couple hundred years old, right on Lake Michigan, beautiful restaurants there. You might have heard of Phil Schmidt's restaurant. Mm -hmm. when you do? They were my parishioners. They were saints. But anyway, I could write a book about Phil Schmidt and, and his wife. But anyhow, uh, 
he used to, um, when it wasn't too inconvenient, he would go down the main street, um, that was 119th Street it was, yes, and with the, he had a little, his, the, the bucket with the water, and he would, with a prayer, sp sprinkle all these stores that were closing so that they wouldn't close. <laughs> That's a great story. That's, that's Herman Miller. <laughs> when he died, he died in, um, let's see, let's see when did Herman Miller died. Bishop Gutka was still living then, and um, he wasn't able to, and I was at uh, Portage then. Yeah, yeah, I was at Nativity for 14 years and built the whole place. But anyway, um, uh, Bishop Gutka called me. He says, oh, he says, well, you, you, you know Father Miller, and he liked you and all that stuff. Would you go over to and have his funeral? And I said, well, where's the funeral? And he said, well, it's in Fort Wayne. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, no, I had Herman's funeral, Herman Miller. I had his funeral. Now, how did we get into talking to that? I well, it's, uh, you're returning to the Diocese of Gary. And oh, as you and say, in terms of funerals and, uh, and parish life and teaching in schools, uh, you were back, as you say, doing what you wanted to do, what you felt you were ordained to do. But that then all changes in 1995 That's right. when you are asked presumably by the nuncio to become the new bishop the fourth bishop of lansing in michigan what do you remember of the day that you were asked it to be the bishop a, it was a shock i would know i i was at st thomas more in munster at that time i was there 11 years and uh it all happened this way i had no idea we were becoming i was 65 already and so uh, I had no idea of becoming a bishop. Uh, I just wanted to be a parish Had priest. you been to the Diocese of Lansing hmm? previously? Did you know the Diocese of I've Lansing? I've never been here in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never been in the... Now, we all know Western Michigan. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the Lake Michigan. Yeah. I mean, the uh, whole Western Michigan. It belongs to Chicago anyway, you know. <laughs> so how do you... Not to give uh, away too many of the, the secrets of how these Episcopal appointments are, if indeed they are, uh, uh, secret or certainly the things that are, have to be oh, I don't discreet. Know. And I how, don't how, know. how did it come about? Well, I, got a, I, was, I had a Bible class in all my parishes every Monday night. And uh, I did that here too. About 100 people there. It was every Monday. It was about a two-hour Bible class, and I was doing that. I think it was about the end of October maybe the 30th, 31st, or somewhere right in there. It was a Monday. And I got back to the rectory at about 9 o'clock or so, and I had two assistants there. And uh, one of them was a recent uh, immigrant from Poland. Nice guy. And the other one was an older guy, Mark Massa, who's now a priest in Los Angeles, no, San Francisco. And they were my assistants. Mark was with me for seven years, and, and uh, the other one was a couple years. So I got into the rectory, and, uh, and they were both in the kitchen table having whatever they're doing. And, and then the, the Polish guy said, you got, you got a phone call, you got a phone call, and, and funny name, funny voice, I don't know who. You know, he had to talk to how he talked English, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, what? what? He, said, uh, he said, oh, him, him calling back, uh, him calling back uh, in nine, at 15 after 9. So... And those two idiots sat there to wait for that, you know. <laughs> they, they could have left town. Oh, I have no idea what. You know what, you know what priests do with each other? They, they, they do make, a, they say, you make you a bishop, or they do this. It's all jokes, you know, and they, they cause mischief and stuff. So anyway, I thought, oh, well, some idiot, a uh, good friend that's going to give me, give me heartache. But anyhow, so um, him calling back. So I waited there at 9.15, the phone rings. And sure enough, uh, not sure enough, and then, then this voice of the other big, 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 strong Italian voice. He was a nuncio in Washington, of mm -hmm. course. And that was uh, his Cardinal uh, Caccia Villan was his name, whom I got to know very well later. But anyhow, so Caccia Villan says, oh, and he said, uh, he said, the first thing he said, uh, are you Carl and so on? I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, you know who I am. And I thought it was some silly priest and all this stuff. And then and there was a big point. He didn't know what to make of it. Because, see, they could get a bad number. And then imagine mm -hmm. telling some idiot that you're made a bishop of Chicago or something, and they don't know who in the hell it is. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so then he said, 
because I was being silly, I think. And then he said, um, how do I know who you are? And then I made it nuttier yet. I said, come on, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then there was a big pause. And then he said to me, see, because this, this priest that, I, that was in Rome for 30 years, it's close, it still is. Mm -hmm. And then he says, do you know Justin Regali? I said, oh, sure, he's my best friend. We were in Rome together. And then there was no more pause. He said, aha, now I know it's you. <laughs> he was all excited about that. So, and then he proceeds to tell me that Pope John Paul II has decided, and then the, the mm -hmm. whole business about that. And then, and then his was, a, do you accept? And, and I said to him, and I said to him, Io sono solmente 75 anni. Do you want tell Italian? You don't Love know. It, yeah. yeah. I said, I said, I'm only, I'm 65 years old. And, and then there was a big pause. And then Caccio Yolan said, Aha! Il Santo Padre è 75. The Holy Father is 75! <laughs> so he, he beat me. <laughs> so did you immediately say yes? Well, then I did, of course. Well, once that happened, uh, well, sure. And no, how did you feel in that moment? I didn't say immediately. I said, I'm 65, mm -hmm. which was, um, tell me about that. <laughs> and he said, uh, uh, the Holy Father is 75. Well, then, and then no, no, I told him that I accept, yeah. And how did you feel about that? The, at age 65, the prospect of... I've always uh, been healthy as an ox. You know, I'm I healthy can see now. That. I no, can see that. No, and, um, and, and I've but, been... But to I've up been sticks a, and to, to, to head off to another state, to, as you say, you'd never been to the Diocese of I Lansing before. None of that occurred to me at okay. all. Okay. None of that. Everything you're thinking about never occurred. The only thing that happened to me is that the Holy Father has made the decision, and I accepted it, and I liked it. And I don't know any answers to all the other junk you're asking me. Well, I'll throw another, another bit of junk at you then. You were here for 12 years. <laughs> for well, I 12 don't years. Here. No, yeah. one second. No, the, here, the, here for, yeah, here for 12 years. Uh, or I day, liked it. Or you liked it. What, Loved it. What are your memories of that time, those 12 years as bishop here in the Diocese of Lansing? What, what are the memories when you look back that, that well, stand I'll give you out so in particular? Why the memories, the memories are, are so vivid is because of why they were so desperately needed at the time, number one. I had never ever considered becoming a bishop, which means there's no background at all. Mm -hmm. Blah, 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 and all that stuff for looking up things. And I, I know there was nothing, there was nothing. All right, a clean slate. Now, the second thing was, now that's not important, but that's true. But the second thing was, I, I knew nothing about the Diocese of Lansing nothing. I didn't even know the name of the bishop of the Diocese of Lansing. Next. I had never been in this geography in my life. That's these ten counties mm -hmm. here. I've never been. Now we, we went to Detroit all the time because I used to go to, um, what's that British play place in, in uh, Canada where they put all the Shakespeare. London. Play. No. That's a city. No where they do all the Shakespeare plays. We used to go there every summer. We'll look up. And we'd have to go drive through Detroit. So I was never in this geography, ever. Second, next, I did not know one human being in these 10 counties. All right? So that's how I came here. And you think that was a benefit, the fact that you were a, a new broom? No, that, 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 that's, uh, some people will say that, that, that I came in knowing nothing and knowing no one here so that everybody here now could make a complete break and make a new start. Mm -hmm. Now that's a lot of baloney. <laughs> Why? It may be true in some cases, but... Um, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, uh, 
I very, very quickly, and I did it with all the, you know, I had, I had these, you know, these parishes that I had, like St. Thomas More, Nativity, they had 3,000 families, that's 10,000 people in those places. No, I, I, no, I, 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 I liked the idea of coming. What were your happiest moments as Bishop of Lansing? I'll tell you what my happiest thing that I did and I liked the most was celebrating the Sacrament of Confirmation. Why? Which I did every year in 96 places, in 96 parishes. Why did I like that? Number one, um, because of all those children. Now some of the parishes, there were 75 confirmed, or, or there's some where there were only five, depending you know, where they were. But th this was a, a great way to get to know the people of that parish, to visit the parish. So you know what they do a lot of times, they'll come burn the seven or eight parishes and have their confirmation in one place. Well, that's stupid. Well, then what about those other parishes? They, they don't have it. Goofy. But anyway, that I liked. And then I loved working with the seminarians. I ordained 33 priests when I was oh. here. Not because of me. And there'll be a lot of them here today for oh, your I know there will socially be. distanced, but here today for, for the ones for the anniversary. that I've ordained, a lot yeah. of them. Yeah. And uh, we have a lot of seminarians right now. We've got about 30 of them, which is man fantastic. But uh, no, I, I like that. And, and, uh, and then another big thing I liked, we had three big universities here with Newman centers. Mm -hmm. You know what the Newman Center mm -hmm. is? That was a, that's a Catholic operation within Chaplaincy, the university. Yeah. yeah, and the priests are involved. And that's the Michigan State and the University of Michigan and Eastern Michigan in Ypsilanti. And I was there very often and involved with much of that too. Gave a lot of talks in those places too at the three universities, which I liked very much. I did, yeah. And how has your retirement been? Well, it's been great because I keep busy. Doing what? <laughs> I'm teaching. I do a lot of writing. And the main thing is I help out in a number of parishes, like St. Gerard. I'm there almost almost every day, but not since COVID. I haven't been there since March. But uh, that's what I did. Oh, yeah. I mean, as you point I out... I never stopped being a priest. What sustains you as a priest? Huh? What sustains you as a priest? The Eucharist. I say Mass every day. If you don't say Mass every day, you may as well quit. Yeah. Because the Church is the Eucharist. If you take the Eucharist away, then what, what, what did Jesus do? Why did Jesus institute that at the Last Supper? That he might stay with the Church and draw us into uh, his total self-gift. Uh, no. No, I would never do that. That's a great note to finish on. Yeah, simple. Bishop Mengling, if I can ask you to, uh, upon this, the uh, day of celebration for your 25th anniversary of ordination and the day of celebration for your 90th birthday, um, if you would give uh, uh, us here and uh, all the people who are watching and listening uh, your, uh, your blessing. Oh, sure. I'll be glad to. Yeah. May oh God, mighty God bless you. He's the one who created you. He's called you to your vocations. And he gives you all the grace you need to do what will bring nothing but holiness and happiness to you and the people that you are called to serve through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bishop Carl Mingling, thank, thank you very much. My, my mm -hmm. biggest prayer every day, and I use it in everything, is to pray for all those in the promises of holy orders, and they make five promises when they're ordained as deacon and priest. All those in the promises of 40 orders, that's one. All those in religious vows, that's the sisters. And all those in the vows of matrimony. Those are the three groups that are at the heart of the whole thing. Like you, a husband and wife and family, you're, you're the heart of civilization itself. And the same with, with you, you're a married mm -hmm. man. But you look at those three, uh, the ones in the promises of the priesthood, you can call them vows too if you want, and then the vows of religious life 
and then the vows of matrimony. And those vows of matrimony, if you ever get a chance to go back to the ritual that you, you said, and your wife said, and there's great detail in there, that's worth going back to. And I wish all married people would do that and go back to that. A lot of them say, oh, the hell with it, forget it, yeah, 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 and all that puke. <laughs> Doesn't work. Well, that's a lovely thought to end but on, that's, Bishop. But that's, that, those are th three of the groups that I pray for most. Priests, religious, married people. Yeah, Bishop Carl Mengling, upon the 25th anniversary of your ordination to the Episcopate and your 90th birthday, uh, congratulations, Ad Multos Anos. And thank you for joining us on this Diocese of Lansing uh, podcast. May God bless you and may they keep you.